Welcome back. In the last lecture, I discussed summer air conditioning system and the psychrometry of summer air conditioning systems. In this lecture, I shall discuss evaporative air conditioning systems, uh, air conditioning systems for the winter and an all year air conditioning system. So, the specific objectives of this particular lecture are to discuss uh, evaporative air conditioning systems, winter air conditioning systems and finally, all year air conditioning systems. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to explain the working principle, advantages, disadvantages and applications of evaporative air conditioning systems, explain the working principle of winter air conditioning systems and describe all year air conditioning systems. So, let me give a brief introduction to evaporative air conditioning systems. Conventional summer air conditioning systems which we have discussed uh, in the last class which are capable of maintaining exactly the required conditions are expensive to own and operate. By conventional air conditioning systems for summer what I mean is the air conditioning systems which are based on refrigeration cycles uh, which in turn are based on either vapor compression systems or vapor absorption systems. These systems can be used in any location and they are uh, they can be used for precise uh, control of the uh, conditions, space conditions. Okay. However, they are very expensive and uh, they are expensive not only the initial cost is high, but the running cost is also high. So, you will find that in certain applications the cost may be prohibitive. In such cases, uh, one has to look for alternative systems. Okay. So, evaporative air conditioning system is an alternative to summer air conditioning systems which can be used in hot and dry climates. So, uh, evaporative air conditioning systems are inexpensive and they offer an attractive alternative to the conventional systems in hot and dry places. And evaporative systems also find applications in hot industrial environments where the use of conventional systems becomes prohibitively expensive because of the large loads involved. So, the evaporative cooling uh, where the principle is very well known and it has been in use for many centuries for cooling water and for providing thermal comfort in hot and dry areas. All of us know that in hot and dry places you can cool water by storing it in earthen pots and here the principle is that the water evaporates from the porous surface of the pot and as a result the water stored in the uh, pot gets cooled. So, we all uh, know this and we are, we are also familiar in uh, hot and dry places that we use dry uh, herbal mats called as kus which provide us when you wet them and when you expose it to an air stream they provide us with cool and uh, nice smelling air. Okay, so, these principles are very well known and they have been in use for many centuries in many countries including India. Okay. So, what is the principle behind this? So, these systems are based on the principle that when unsaturated air comes in contact with a wetter surface whose temperature is higher than the dew point temperature of air, some water from the wetter surface evaporates. So, there is a basically evaporation of water from the wetter surface. As a result of this, the air which is in contact with the wetter surface becomes cool and uh, humidified. And this cooled and humidified air can be used for providing thermal comfort. So, this is the principle, a simple principle behind the evaporative cooling systems. Now, evaporative cooling can be provided uh, either by a direct uh, process or using an indirect process or using a combination of both. First, let us look at the direct uh, evaporative process. In direct evaporative cooling systems, the process or conditioned air comes in direct contact with the wetted surface and gets cooled and humidified. That is why you call it as direct evaporative system, but because there is a direct contact between the wetted surface and the uh, process air. And in an ideal case, the exit temperature of air will be equal to the wet bulb temperature of the incoming air. I will explain what is an ideal case. However, in actual system, we find that the exit temperature will be a few degrees higher than the wet bulb temperature of incoming air. So, let me show the schematic of a direct evaporative cooling system. First, so here you can see a simple uh, an elementary direct uh, evaporative cooling system. This is called as a single stage system. You can see from the schematic that uh, outdoor air, okay, outdoor air which is hot and dry, dry means which has very less moisture content first flows through a filter. This filter filters the air and it removes any dust particles etcetera and the filtered air flows through an evaporative cooler or an air washer. In the evaporative cooler or the air washer, this dry and uh, hot air comes in contact with a wetted surface or a water spray if you are using a, an air washer. Since this air is unsaturated, 
uh, there will be evaporation of water from the wetted surface to the uh, air. Since evaporation is an endothermic process, the latent heat of evaporation has to be supplied and this latent heat of evaporation is supplied by air or water or both. So, in this process what happens? The air which comes out of the evaporative cooler becomes cooled. Okay. It, may, it, it loses its temperature because uh, the sensible heat is used for uh, converting uh, water liquid into vapor. Okay. So, at the exit of the evaporative cooler you have cool and uh, moist air or cool and humidified air. Okay. Cool and humidified air. So, this cold and uh, humidified air is blown into the conditioned space where you want to maintain the comfort conditions using a blower. Okay. So, that, that air you call it as supply air. So, this supply air which is uh, at a lower temperature but at a higher humidity flows through the conditioned space and as it flows through the conditioned space, it extracts the uh, sensible and latent heat from the building and it maintains the conditioned space at the required conditions. And finally, the air is exhausted or vented out of the building. Okay, so, this is the principle of an elementary direct evaporative cooling process system. The same uh, thing is shown on the psychrometric chart here. We have the dry bulb temperature on the x axis and humidity ratio on the y axis. So, point O is the condition of the air at the inlet to the system. Okay, so, as you can see here, here the temperature is high and uh, humidity is low. That means, the air is hot and unsaturated. So, as it flows through the uh, evaporative cooler or air washer, it gets cooled and uh, humidified. So, its temperature reduces and its humidity increases. That means, it follows the process O s. Okay. So, it uh, moves in this direction and uh, point s is the exit condition of the air at the evaporator cooler and this air which is cooled and uh, humidifi humidified is uh, sent to the conditioned space. So, as it flows through the conditioned space, it extracts the sensible and latent heat and finally, leaves the conditioned space at this state i. Okay. And this line, line Si is nothing but room sensible heat factor line which we have discussed in the last lecture. Okay. So, this is uh, the basic uh, principle of uh, direct evaporative cooling system. As I have uh, mentioned, in an ideal case, the exit temperature of air will be equal to the wet bulb temperature of the incoming air but in an actual case, the exit temperature will be higher. So, what do we mean by an ideal case? Ideal case means uh, this evaporative cooler or the air washer is perfectly insulated. Okay. Then you call it as this is perfectly insulated from the surroundings. Okay. That means, the process is adiabatic. Right? And uh, there is an infinite uh, area of contact between the air and the wetted surface. Okay. In such cases, what happens is the process line follows the constant wet bulb temperature line. So, if, if it is perfectly insulated, this is your constant wet bulb temperature line. Okay. And uh, the exit condition will be same as the wet bulb temperature. That means, the exit will lie somewhere here. Okay, so, this will be our exit temperature right? in an ideal case, but you will find that in an actual case, uh, there will be some uh, heat leaks into the system. As a result, the process line lies slightly above the wet bulb temperature line and the exit temperature will be higher than the wet bulb temperature. That means, instead of being here, the exit condition will be at point F, which is few degrees higher than the wet bulb temperature line. Okay. Since the exit temperature is higher than the wet bulb temperature line, we can define what is known as saturation efficiency or effectiveness of the evaporative cooling system epsilon. This is defined as uh, you can see here T naught minus T s divided by T naught minus T naught subscript W B T, where T naught is the inlet dry bulb temperature, T s is the exit dry bulb temperature of the air and uh, T subscript O W B T is the wet bulb temperature at the inlet condition. So, this is uh, very clear from your psychrometric chart. If you look at the psychrometric chart, uh, this is the expression for effectiveness or efficiency. As you can see T naught minus T s is nothing but this temperature drop okay. or you can call this as actual temperature drop and the T naught minus T W B T is nothing but this. Okay. So, in an ideal case you get uh, this, but in an actual case the actual temperature drop will be lower. So, the efficiency or effectiveness is nothing but this divided by this. Okay. Now, depending upon the design aspects of the evaporative cooling system, uh, 
The effectiveness may vary from 50 percent for simple drip type uh, evaporative coolers and it can be as high as 90 percent for efficient spray pads or air washer based systems. Okay. So, the efficiency will vary from 50 to 90 percent depending upon the design. Now, the required flow rate of air is obtained from energy balance of the conditioned space. We have to find out what is the required air flow rate. So, that is that can be easily obtained if you take a control volume across the conditioned space and if you assume that uh, steady state conditions prevail. So, you take a control volume across this and apply energy balance okay, and neglect kinetic and potential energy changes. So, the rate at which heat is being added to the conditioned space that is nothing but Qt should be equal to the rate at which heat is being extracted by this air stream. Okay. So, energy balance becomes Qt is simply equal to m dot s into H i minus H s where H i is the exit enthalpy, H s is the inlet enthalpy. Okay. So, this is the energy balance assuming of course, uh, negligible kinetic and potential energy changes for the supply air. So, from this expression you can find out what is the required air flow rate m dot s which is nothing but q t divided by h i minus h s. So, if you know what is the rate of uh, uh, heat transfer to the conditioned space q t if this is known and h i is nothing but uh, the enthalpy of the conditioned space air. So, which is normally known from our uh, requirements. So, h i is known to us and if you can fix the supply condition h s then you can find out the required mass flow rate of supply air. Okay. Compared to the conventional refrigeration based air conditioning systems, the air flow rate required is much larger in case of evaporative cooling systems. This is uh, this can be viewed as an advantage or it can also be viewed as a disadvantage. Normally, it is observed that uh, for the same cooling capacity uh, and for same uh, inlet and uh, outdoor conditions, uh, the required air flow rate. Uh, in case of uh, evaporative air cooling systems will be uh, about 8 to 10 times. It can be as high as 8 to 10 times that of a normal uh, air conditioning system which is based on vapor compression or vapor absorption system. So, the air flow rate required is very, very high. Okay. And the required air flow rate increases as moisture content of outdoor air increases. This I will explain with the help of a psychrometric chart. And we also find that beyond a certain moisture content value evaporative cooler cannot provide comfort as the cooling and humidification line lies above the conditioned space condition. Okay. So, one thing you must observe is uh, the required mass flow rate increases as the uh, outdoor air humidity increases and beyond a certain point these coolers will simply uh, they cannot simply work. Okay. You cannot use the coolers when the outdoor air humidity exceeds certain value. Okay. So, let me show that by using a psychrometric chart. Okay, so, this is uh, again uh, what I have shown earlier. This is the psychrometric chart. You have the dribble temperature and humidity uh, ratio and uh, this is your uh, cooling and humidification process that take place in a evaporative cooler. Okay, so, O is the inlet condition and S is the supply condition and we have seen that from energy balance the required uh, uh, air flow rate M dot S is Q T divided by H i minus H S. Okay. Let us say that this is your uh, humidity that means this is your inlet condition okay, the which is nothing but the condition of the outdoor air. Then H i minus H s is nothing but if you draw enthalpy constant enthalpy line this is your H i minus H s. So, you can see that the required uh, mass flow rate is inversely proportional to this enthalpy difference. Now, if uh, the temperature remains same let us say and the humidity ratio increases to this point. Okay, when the humidity ratio increases to this point, H i minus H s decreases because now the H i minus H s is this. Okay. Since, H i minus H s decreases, mass flow rate of air increases. If the humidity increases further to this point, let us say, then there is further uh, reduction in enthalpy rise across the conditioned space. So, there is a further uh, increase in the mass flow rate of conditioned uh, mass flow rate of the supply air and you find that beyond a certain point. For example, if you let us say that uh, humidity ratio is at this point, temperature is same, but humidity ratio is here. Then when you use an evaporative cooler, you find that the process line proceeds like this. Okay, That means, it does not intersect this room sensible heat factor line at all. Okay, That means, you cannot use evaporative cooler beyond a certain point. In fact, when the humidity ratio uh, lies at this point and if the process line pass, passes through the conditions uh, point i, then you will find that the required amount of uh, supply air is infinite. Okay. So, beyond a certain uh, humidity ratio, this system does not work. Okay. So, this is a very important thing uh, one must keep in mind. 
Now let us look at indirect evaporative cooling system. So far we have discussed direct evaporative cooling system. Now let us look at indirect systems. In an indirect system, we use a primary air stream and a secondary air stream. That means two air streams are used. The primary air stream becomes cooled and humidified by direct evaporation process. Whereas the secondary air stream, which is nothing but the supply air to the conditioned space, undergoes only sensible cooling as it exchanges sensible heat with a cooled and humidified air stream. Though the temperature drop of secondary air is lower compared to a direct process, since the humidity ratio remains constant, the indirect systems may be applied over a broader range of outdoor conditions. Okay, this is the advantage of indirect evaporative cooling systems uh, over direct evaporative cooling systems. Now let me show a schematic of indirect system. Okay, so as I said, uh, here you have uh, two air streams. One is primary air, the other one is secondary air. Okay, the so first primary air is cooled and uh, humidified in this evaporative cooler. So this is your evaporative cooler. Okay, so as the primary air flows through this evaporative cooler, it gets cooled and humidified. Now this cooled and uh, humidified air is blown through an air to air heat exchanger. Okay, so this is an air to air heat exchanger. Let us uh, for the sake of simplicity, let us assume that it is a Finland tube type of heat exchanger and this cooled and humidified air flows through the tubes, let us say. And the secondary air, which is nothing but the supply air to the conditioned space, flows over the tubes and over the fins. Okay, so there is no direct contact between the primary and secondary air. Okay, so secondary air is flowing in this direction, and primary air is flowing through the tubes. Since the temperature of the primary air is lower than the secondary air, there will be sensible heat exchange between the secondary air and primary air. As a result, you find that the secondary air gets cooled sensibly. Okay, so at this point, the temperature. Uh, let us say this T outlet will be lower than the T inlet for the secondary stream. So, this cold air is supplied to the conditioned space for providing thermal comfort. Okay, so, this is the uh, this is an elementary indirect evaporative cooling system and the same thing is shown here on a psychrometric chart. You can see here that process O to O dash is what happens to the primary air as it flows through the evaporative cooler. As you know, it gets cooled and uh, humidified. In an ideal case, it leaves the evaporative cooler at the wet bulb temperature. Also. Okay, so this is the process undergone by primary air. So at this point, this air enters into the air to air heat exchanger. Okay, so in the air to air heat exchanger, this exchanges heat with the secondary air, which is again at this temperature. Okay, so there is a heat exchange between the hot air, which is at this temperature, and cold air, which is at this temperature. Okay, so since there is no direct contact, the secondary air uh, undergoes only sensible cooling, so its temperature reduces in this direction, and the primary air uh, temperature increases in this direction. Okay, so finally the primary air uh, is exhausted at this point at condition E. And the secondary air, which is at the temperature S, is supplied to the conditioned space. You can see here that the secondary air, which is nothing but our conditioned air, gets cooled, but its humidity ratio remains constant. Okay, that means uh, inlet and outlet humidity ratios remain constant. So this is an advantage of indirect cooler because we are not increasing the humidity of the air. Whereas you can see that the temperature uh, drop of the secondary air is only this much. Okay, whereas the temperature drop of the primary air is higher. Okay, so this is uh, one disadvantage of indirect uh, evaporative cooler because the require uh, available temperature drop is reduced. In modern day, uh, what I have shown is only a schematic and in modern day indirect evaporative coolers, what is done is the conditioned air flows through tubes or plates made of non-corroding plastic materials such as polystyrene PS or polyvinyl chloride. Okay, that means what happens in an indi modern uh, indirect coolers are you have a tube, let us say. Okay, you have a tube like this. Okay, this is just a schematic. So through this, your secondary air flows. Okay, secondary air. Okay, so this is the wall of the tube, and you maintain a uh, thin layer of water on the outside of this tube. So this is a layer of water. Okay, so this is water layer and over this the primary air will be blowing. Okay. So as the primary air blows over the tube, the wetted tube, water evaporates from the thin layer. Okay. So as a result, uh, there is a sensible heat transfer here. So this uh, layer becomes cold and there will be heat exchange from the thin layer to the secondary air which is flowing through the tube. Okay. 
So, as I said on the outside of the plastic tubes or plates thin film of water is maintained. Water from the liquid film on the outside of the tubes or plates evaporates into the air blowing over it and cools the conditioned air flowing through the tubes or plates sensibly. Okay. And uh, using this kind of an arrangement you can get an effectiveness as high as 80 percent. Even though you may be surprised uh, that we use plastic uh, materials, uh, plastic tubes or plastic plates uh, in a heat exchanger because as you know plastic has uh, low thermal conductivity. Still uh, you manage to get high effectiveness because uh, you get very high heat transfer coefficients outside the tube because outside the tube you have latent heat transfer. Okay. So, uh, since latent heat transfer provides high heat transfer coefficient you get very large convective heat transfer coefficient on the outside and this more than makes up for the low thermal conductivity of the tube material or plate material. Okay. As a result you get very good uh, effectiveness for with this kind of uh, evaporative coolers okay. and plastic is also cheaper and it is also easier to manufacture. Now, several modifications are possible which improve efficiency of the evaporative cooling systems significantly. Okay. So, let us look at what are these modifications. I will just discuss one or two modifications. One simple modification is that uh, you can sensibly cool the outdoor air before sending it to the evaporative cooler by exchanging heat with the exhaust air from the conditioned space. So, so this is one of the simple uh, improvements. So, let me explain this. Remember that this is the air in a normal uh, simple system uh, you are throwing this exhaust air into the atmosphere and this exhaust air is at a temperature equal to that of the conditioned space. Okay. Conditioned space temperature is Ti let us say and we know that the conditioned space temperature Ti is less than Tio. Okay. That means the temperature of the air at this point will be less than the outdoor air. Okay. So, what you can do is you can exchange heat between these two. For example, if I put a heat exchanger here. Okay. So, this uh, air flows through this like this and this primary air before uh, sending it to the air washer flows through this let us say it flows like this. So, as a result what happens the temperature of the outdoor air gets reduced as it exchanges heat with the exhaust air. So, what enters the evaporative cooler is a cooled air that means instead of entering at this point uh, this will be sensibly cooled by exchanging heat and at this point uh, cooling and dehumidification takes place. So, you can see that you can achieve lower temperatures. Uh, by using this simple modification. Of course, uh, achieving good uh, heat exchanger effectiveness using uh, air to air kind of a heat exchanger is very difficult because you have to have large surface area etcetera. That means, you have to use a compact heat exchanger if you want to have good effectiveness. Okay. So, you have to see the benefit versus the cost involved. Okay. But in principle this is a simple uh, modification which can give a certain improvement. One can also use the multi stage systems and using multi stage systems it is possible to cool the air to a temperature that is several degrees lower than the wet bulb temperature of incoming air. So, this is an advantage of multi stage systems. So, let me explain a very simple multi stage system. Okay, so, this shows a simple uh, a two stage uh, direct indirect evaporative cooling system. Again uh, we have a primary uh, primary uh, air stream here and a secondary air stream here. So, in the first stage what happens is the primary air stream is cooled and humidified in the evaporative cooler okay, like we have discussed earlier evaporative cooler. So, it gets cooled and uh, humidified then this cooled and uh, humidified air flows through an air to air heat exchanger okay air to air heat exchanger where it exchanges sensible heat with the secondary air. Okay. So, up to this point it is exactly similar to an indirect evaporative cooler. So, what you get out of this first stage is a cold air okay, whose humidity is same as the outdoor air humidity. right? So, its temperature reduces, but humidity remains constant. Now, in the second stage this point onward this is the second stage. In the second stage what happens is this secondary air undergoes direct uh, cooling and humidification in a second evaporative cooler. This is your second uh, evaporative cooler. Okay. So, in the first stage only primary air gets cooled and humidified and secondary air exchanges sensible heat whereas, in the second stage the secondary air undergoes cooling and humidification. So, as a result what you get out of uh, this that means, at the final uh, exit of the system you get uh, air which is much cooler than the incoming wet bulb temperature in a uh, okay, wet bulb temperature the incoming air. The same thing is shown here on the psychrometric chart. Uh, for example, 
uh, this is the condition of the secondary air here and the primary air here okay so the primary air undergoes cooling and uh, humidification so o dash is the exit of uh, the first evaporative cooler and at this point this flows through the air to air heat exchanger so its temperature increases and the temperature of the secondary air reduces in this direction okay so at the end of this okay point 1 is here so at this point it enters into the second evaporative cooler okay where it undergoes uh, cooling and humidification so finally what leaves uh, this uh, complete unit uh, is air in an ideal case which is at a temperature t2 okay so this is the final temperature of air from this system now you can see that this temperature t2 is much lower than the wet bulb temperature corresponding to the inlet air that is nothing but this okay that this is the wet bulb temperature corresponding to outdoor condition and this is your exit temperature ts so you can see that ts is lower than t wet bulb temperature okay so this is a simple uh, two stage system one can also think of uh, other schemes okay one can also go for uh, three stage right three stage direct indirect direct direct indirect like that several schemes are possible so using these uh, multi stage uh, schemes you can achieve temperatures which are much lower than the uh, wet bulb temperature of the incoming air but of course the advantage uh, disadvantage of these kind of systems are the cost increases because you are adding more and more components okay so the initial cost of the system increases and the running cost also increases because uh, Oh, you have several pumps and blowers, etc. All these uh, components require some power. Okay, so both running as well as uh, initial cost increase, and the benefit you get is you get it air which is at much lower temperature. So you have to again see which is beneficial, right? One thing I forgot to mention is the use of this pump. Okay. So we use a, we have to use a water pump in an evaporative cooler because in a typical evaporative cooler you have to maintain these uh, wetted surfaces continuously wet. Okay, these are the wetted surfaces which have to remain wet continuously. So what you have here is a pool of water. Okay a pool of water this pool of water uh, the pump is connected to this pool of water so it continuously draws water from this uh, uh, pool and it uh, pumps it to the top of the evaporative air cooler and it uh, uh, throws it uh, on to the wetted pads or if it is an air washer then it sprays the water droplets into the air washer okay so the pump is required for the continuous circulation of the water whereas the blower is required for i'm sorry a blower is required here for circulation of air okay So this is, this is, these are some uh, improvements using which you can extend the application of evaporative coolers. Now let us look at the advantages and disadvantages of uh, evaporative coolers. What are the advantages? First advantage of course is that uh, they have a lower equipment cost and installation cost compared to uh, the conventional refrigeration system based uh, air conditioning systems. Okay, The equipment and installation cost can be several times lower than the conventional systems. And they also have substantially lower operating and power costs because uh, all that you require is power for running the blower and for pump. You do not have a compressor there, so the power consumption is reduced substantially. And the energy savings can be as high as 75 percent compared to a conventional air conditioning system. This is a major advantage of evaporative cooling systems. And of course, the third advantage is that it is very easy to fabricate. Uh, these systems and it is also easy to install. The fabrication is so easy that it is like a cottage industry or like a small scale industry and in several places in India a very small, uh, small industries manufacture uh, these evaporative coolers. So as a result uh, they are available at a much lower rate okay whereas uh, the conventional systems uh, not everybody can manufacture them because the manufacture of uh, compressor and all uh, is a very expensive business. So. Uh, fabrication is also difficult there whereas the operative coolers can be fabricated very easily and the installation is also very easy for example if you are using it uh, for cooling a room you do not require any installation at all all that you have to do is uh, buy it bring it and plug it in okay so it is as simple as that but if you want to use a, a conventional air conditioning system then you have to install the system you have to create uh, air ducts etc okay and the lower maintenance cost since you do not have any compressor the maintenance cost is considerably reduced so this is another advantage and these systems ensure very good ventilation the, uh, this is because uh, as i have already mentioned uh, the required air flow rates are very large in these systems and typically in these system you don't recirculate the air 
So, whereas in a conventional system you recirculate the air, but whereas in an evaporative system you exhaust the air, okay. So, you continuously draw fresh air, cool and humidify it and supply it to the conditioned space, okay. Uh, so, no, not much of recirculation is used, recirculation is not very effective also. So, as a result uh, a continuous supply of large amount of fresh air is ensured whenever you are using evaporative cooler. So, this will take care of ventilation, okay. So, so this is another major advantage. So, because of the large flow rates involved, uh, the conditioned space air distribution is also ensured. That means, you get better conditioned space air distribution because of the large amount of air flow rates involved. And there are no infiltration losses because the air flow rate is uh, very high. So, normally you find that whenever you are conditioning a building using evaporative cooling system, the pressure inside the building will be positive. That means, the pressure inside will be higher than the outside pressure. So, as a result if there is any leakage, it will be a leakage of uh, air from the inside to the outside, not the other way, okay. That means, uh, there will not be any infiltration of outdoor air into the system, into the conditioned space. So, there are no infiltration losses, right. And last but not least, uh, these systems are environment friendly. These systems are environment friendly because we do not use any uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons or any harmful chemicals, etc. in these systems. So, all that we use is air and water, okay. So, they are very, very environment friendly systems, okay. So, so in, over and above that since they consume uh, less power, obviously they also lead to lower global warming potential, okay. Now, however, these systems obviously have some disadvantages. What are the disadvantages of these systems? First disadvantage is that uh, higher moisture levels in the conditioned space because you are the air that you supply to the room is uh, at a much uh, higher humidity uh, ratio. So, the moisture levels in the conditioned space will be higher. And uh, these systems may create draft or uh, high noise levels in the conditioned space due to large air flow rates involved. Okay, since you have uh, you have to deal with large air flow rate inside the, the fan uh, may create la, a large noise. Okay, since the flow rate is also high, you will also have uh, you may also have uh, the feeling of draft. This could be a disadvantage from the comfort point of view. And another uh, disadvantage with these systems is that precise control of temperature and humidity in the conditioned space is not possible. Whereas using a conventional system, you can precisely control the temperature and humidity inside the conditioned space. And fourth uh, disadvantage is that uh, these systems may lead to health problems due to microorganisms if the water used is not clean or the wetted surface are not maintained properly, okay. So, if the if you use a dirty water or if you do not clean the evaporative coolers from time to time, then uh, fungus or al algae or something may form inside the evaporative cooler or on the wetted surfaces which may give rise to growth of uh, microorganisms. And since air blows over it and you inhale that air, uh, this air may give rise to health hazards, okay. So, you have to maintain it properly so that no fungus formation or no microorganism formation uh, take place, okay. Now, let us look at the applicability of evaporative cooling systems. I have mentioned that uh, uh, one of the disadvantages or one of the limitations of evaporative air cooling system is that uh, as the outdoor air humidity increases, the required uh, mass flow rate of air increases and beyond a certain uh, humidity ratio, you cannot use uh, evaporative cooling systems, okay. That means, you can use them beneficially in certain locations and you cannot use them in certain locations. So, how do we decide where uh, these systems can be used or where these systems cannot be used? What are the guidelines, okay. So, let us look at uh, these guidelines. It is uh, observed that these systems can provide some measure of comfort in any location, okay. However, when humidity levels are very high, evaporative cooling systems cannot be used for providing thermal comfort, especially in residences, office buildings, etc. In residences and office buildings, etc., providing thermal comfort at the required level, that means maintaining the conditioned space at the required level is very important, okay. That is the primary job of any air conditioning system. Okay. If the outside humidity uh, ratio is very high or the outside the air is very uh, moist, then uh, we have seen that these systems, so that means the evaporative air cooling system cannot provide uh, the required levels of comfort. That means, you cannot use them for comfort applications where the out outdoor air is very moist or uh, very humid, okay. So, what are the useful guidelines? They, these guidelines are not very stringent, but they just give uh, some idea on where you can use 
or where you cannot use them. Okay. So one older uh, guideline is that uh, evaporative cooling should be considered as a viable alternative in locations where the average known relative humidity in July is less than 40 percent. Okay. That means if uh, the no relative humidity at noon uh, uh, during the month of July, average relative humidity during the month of July at noon, if it is less than 40 percent, then you can definitely use uh, evaporative coolers and you must consider evaporative coolers as a viable alternative to the more expensive uh, conventional air conditioning systems. Okay. However, it is seen that you can also use evaporative coolers uh, in areas where the known relative humidity is higher than slightly higher than 40 percent. Okay. So, that means this is a very stringent guideline. So, there is another broader guideline which says that uh, evaporative coolers can be used in places where the design wet bulb temperature in summer is less than about 24 degrees centigrade or about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. That means, uh, if you know the design wet bulb temperature during summer and if you know that it is less than about 24 degrees centigrade, then again you can consider the use of evaporative coolers. Okay. These guidelines are uh, obtained mainly for single stage direct evaporative coolers. And the indirect evaporative coolers and multi-stage coolers can be used over a broader range. Okay, that means you cannot simply say that evaporative coolers cannot be used in particular location. Okay, you cannot use a simple direct evaporative cooler in certain locations. But if you make modifications, if you use a multi-stage system, you can extend the range of application of these systems. Okay, to even humid areas. And uh, these uh, systems are highly suitable in applications requiring large amounts of ventilation. Okay. There are many applications such as textile mills, foundries, dry cleaning plants, etc., which require large amount of ventilation. And here uh, you cannot provide full comfort, but uh, even if you can provide a partial uh, comfort, that is more than welcome. So, in such situations, you can think of using evaporative coolers, which will give you a very cost effective solution. Okay. And evaporative coolers can be combined with conventional systems leading to lower total energy consumption. That means, you can also think of hybrid systems which use a combination of evaporative cooling systems and a conventional air conditioning systems. Okay. Using a combination of these two, uh, you can uh, arrive at lower uh, energy consumption. Okay. So, one simple uh, scheme is that uh, the outdoor air is first uh, cooled in an evaporative cooler then you send that uh, cooled air, which is not cooled to the required uh, extent, but which it is cooled to certain extent. That cold air is sent to the conventional air conditioning system, so that the load on the conventional air conditioning system reduces, okay. so which will give rise to uh, savings in energy. Right? So, there are a lot of possibilities where you can uh, uh, have think of hybrid cycles. Okay. So, as, as far as possible, uh, looking at the geographic uh, uh, locations and looking at the climatic conditions, one must uh, see first of all whether one can use evaporative coolers or not. If we can use evaporative coolers, then you should definitely use it because it is it is having many advantages and it gives rise to many benefits both as uh, in terms of initial cost as well as in, in terms of running cost. Okay. And uh, however, there are certain applications as I have already mentioned where you cannot use them. Okay. In certain in such cases, you have to go for the conventional systems. Okay. Now, let us look at winter air conditioning systems. In winter, outside conditions are cold and dry. So, that means outside temperature will be very low and outside humidity will be very low. That means outside moisture content will be low. As a result, there will be continuous transfer of sensible heat as well as moisture from the buildings to the outside. That means, the buildings continuously lose sensible and latent heat to the outside environment. So, in order to maintain required comfort conditions, air supply to the conditioned space should be heated and humidified. In summer, outside conditions are hot and humid. So, what you have to do is you have to supply air that is uh, cold and dry. Okay. That means, you have to generally supply cold and dehumidified air in a conventional system. Whereas, in winter, it is exactly opposite. You have outside conditions which are cold and dry. Okay. So, there will be heat losses from the building. So, to overcome the heat losses, you have to supply air which is hot and humid. Okay. That means, basically you are looking for a heating and humidification process. Okay. And another difference between summer and winter is that in winter, the heat losses from the conditioned space are partially offset by solar and internal heat gains. Okay. The solar energy actually adds heat to the building and the internal heat gains are also add heat to the building. So, the, it partially offsets the heat losses from the building. So, in a conservative approach, what is done is that these heat gains are not at all considered in the design. 
okay. uh, and you assume that there is no internal heat gain and there are no solar heat gains and you arrive at the required system capacity. So, this is a conservative design approach as far as winter air conditioning systems are concerned. Now, heating and humidification of air can be achieved by different schemes. For example, uh, you can use a preheater, a humidifier and a reheater. So, let me uh, explain this system. This is a winter air conditioning system which uses a preheater. Okay. So, we, uh, let us be, let me begin at this point. Here you have uh, outdoor air which is cold and dry. This certain amount of outdoor air is mixed with the recirculated air which is coming from the conditioned space. Okay, so, the recirculated air from the conditioned space and the outdoor air are mixed and the mixed air which is at condition M first flows through a preheater. Okay, this is a preheater. In the preheater, air undergoes sensible heating process. That means, its moisture content remains same, but its temperature increases from T m to T 1. Okay, so, only sensible heating takes place in the preheater. Now, this uh, heated air flows through a humidifier. In the humidifier as the name implies, water vapor is added to the air. Okay, that means, the moisture content of the air increases. Okay. So, the humid air now flows through a reheater. Okay. So, uh, it enters uh, the reheater at state 2 uh, which has high moisture content and this humid air flows through reheater where it is heated to the required supply air temperature S. So, this hot and uh, humid air, okay, hot and humid air flows through the condition space where uh, it takes care of the sensible and heat losses from the building. Okay. So, finally, this hot and humid air uh, leaves the condition space at uh, state I which is same as the state of the condition space. Okay, right. And uh, this return air, some amount of return air is thrown out. This amount is equal to the outdoor air which is required for ventilation purposes and uh, re remaining amount is recirculated. Again the recirculated uh, air comes here, it mixes with the outdoor air and the, again the mixed air flows through preheater, humidifier, reheater, etc. The cycle continues. Okay. So, this is one typical winter air conditioning system which uses a preheater. The same process is shown here on the psychrometric chart. O is the condition of the outdoor air. As you can see, the temperature is very low. So, here the driable temperature on this axis, you have driable temperature and here you have the humidity. So, the outdoor air is very cold and uh, very dry. This is mixed with the uh, recirculated air which is at the condition I. Okay. Certain amount of air at this state and certain amount of air at this state, they are mixed. So, the resulting air is at this condition M. Okay. So, at this condition, it enters into the preheater and it is sensibly heated from T m to T 1. Okay. So, m to 1 is what happens in the preheater. So, at this point it enters into the humidifier. In the humidifier as I have already mentioned, the humidity of the air is increased. So, it follows the process line 1 to 2 and this process path depends upon uh, how humidifier is constructed or how you are adding the moisture. Okay. Whatever it is, uh, humidity increases in the humidifier from point 1 to 2 and this uh, humid air now flows through the reheater reheater again the process is sensible heating. So, its temperature increases from T 2 to T s. Okay. So, this is the state at the inlet to the condition space. Okay. So, this hot and humid air flows through the condition space and as it flows through the condition space, it takes care of the sensible and latent uh, heat losses. And this uh, line, line S 2 O is again your RSHF line for the winter. Okay. So, this is your uh, psychrometric uh, uh, cycle right, for a winter air conditioning system using a preheater. So, this is one way by which you can heat and humidify the air. You can also use an air washer and a reheater and you can again have the same heating and humidification. Let us look at this scheme. So, in this scheme you can see that it is exactly, it is almost similar to the earlier scheme except one difference, that difference is that you do not use any preheater here. Instead of a preheater, you use an air washer. Okay. This air washer uh, directly humidifies the air. Right. So, outdoor air again, uh, outdoor air and uh, recirculated air are mixed. So, the mixed air at condition M flows to the air washer and in the air washer, its humidity increases to the required level and this humid air now flows through the heater where it is sensibly heated to the required supply temperature S. And this hot and uh, humid air flows through the condition space, takes care of the load and uh, 
comes out at uh, the condition space condition i okay and some part of it is exhausted and the remaining part is recirculated okay so this is another system which doesn't have a preheater and uh, this process is shown again in the psychromatic chart here you have the outdoor air and the recirculated air both are mixed so this is the condition of the mixed air so this uh, process m21 is what happens in the air washer so the humidity increases to the required level okay and at this point it enters into the heater where it is sensibly heated to the required temperature s okay and at this state it enters into the building right and as it flows to the building it takes care of the load and again this is your rshf line okay so this is another system now preheating of course has certain advantages what are the advantages of preheating preheating of air uh, is advantages as it ensures that water in the humidifier uh, or air washer does not freeze and in addition by controlling the heat supplied in the preheater one can control the moisture content in the condition space okay that means when you are using a preheater if this air is let us say very uh, cold okay let's say that this air is at minus 20 degree centigrade which is possible in cold countries if this air is very cold there is a possibility that the mixed air is at a temperature lower than 0 degree centigrade if it is at a temperature lower than 0 degree centigrade and if you do not use a preheater in the humidifier water uh, droplets or wetted surface comes in contact with air whose temperature is lower than the freezing point so there is a possibility that the water may freeze in the humidifier okay so this can be prevented by using a preheater so in the preheater since you are using uh, since you are heating the air fast its temperature increases beyond the freezing point so there won't be any freezing in the humidifier okay so that is the advantage of using a preheater in addition to that you can control uh, the heat supply to the preheater okay by controlling this you can control the humidity level in the condition space okay so the advantage of using this system now the humidification of air can be achieved in several ways for example you can uh, humidify air by bringing it in contact with the wetted surface or with droplets of water as in an air washer or by adding aerosol sized water dro droplets directly to air or by direct addition of dry saturated or superheated steam okay so these are the ways by which you can add the water vapor to the air humidification by direct contact with wetted surface or with water droplets is not recommended for comfort conditions this is for the same reason which i have explained earlier because whenever you are using a wetted surface there is a possibility of uh, microorganisms growing on the wetted surface which may give rise to health problems okay so in uh, comfort air conditioning systems for winter normally uh, wetted surfaces or uh, air washers are not used okay air washers or wetted surfaces can be used for uh, industrial air conditioning systems where uh, human beings are not present okay because of the health problems right so uh, for comfort applications direct addition of dry saturated or superheated steam is generally employed so that means in winter air conditioning systems for comfort you always add steam directly to the uh, air stream okay when humidification is carried out by using a wetted surface then the temperature of air decreases as its moisture content increases okay now there is a difference uh, between the process line when you are using a wetted surface or when you are adding a dry steam okay for example when you are uh, using a wetted surface okay such as an air washer or a something like an evaporative cooler where the air comes in contact with a wetted surface what happens is water uh, evaporates okay and the latent heat of vaporization is drawn from water and air as a result the temperature of air reduces that means the process um, moves along the or uh, close to the wet bulb temperature line okay so whenever uh, we are using a wetted surface How, however if you are using uh, a dry steam then you find that the humidification process proceeds close to the constant dry bulb temperature line okay so i, I can explain this uh, using a psychrometric chart for example uh, let's say that this is a psychrometric chart okay let's say that this is the inlet condition of air uh, to the humidifier and if you are using uh, a wetted uh, surface okay that means uh, this uh, then uh, you find that if this is your uh, wet bulb temperature line the process line may uh, proceed along uh, this or slightly close to this okay so the outlet temperature will be lower than the inlet temperature 
okay whereas if you are using uh, steam okay and if you are using steam you find that the humidification process uh, follows uh, close to the constant driable temperature and you know that this is the driable temperature line okay uh, and if the steam is superheated the exit temperature will be slightly higher than the inlet temperature right so this is the difference uh, between the humidification process uh, which depends upon the way how you are humidifying the air and for all cases the exit condition can be obtained by applying mass and energy balance equations across the humidifier okay so what are be the process uh, if you want to find out the exit condition all the all that you have to do is you have to take a control volume across the humidifier and apply mass balance and energy balance mass balance means you have to account for the uh, mass flow rate of water vapor and mass flow rate of dry air and similarly you have to account for the energy uh, energy okay the uh, rate at which energy is uh, being added uh, is equal to the rate at which energy is being removed in a steady state so if you apply the mass and energy balance equation you can get the value of the uh, out, uh, outlet temperature and outlet humidity okay and the amount of supply air required amount of heat to be supplied in the preheater and reheater amount of steam or water to be added in the humidifier all these things can be obtained by simply applying mass and energy balance equations across the building or across individual components let me explain this this is very easy you can uh, for example i want to find out what should be the uh, supply air flow rate okay i want to find out this okay what should be the supply air flow rate uh, m dot s then what i do is i take uh, a control volume across the condition space and uh, suppose uh, from load calculations i know what is the rate at which uh, sensible heat is being lost from the building and what is the rate at which latent heat is being lost from the building i know qs and ql then if i apply energy balance for this control volume i can write qs uh, like this qs is equal to m dot s into cpm into ts minus ti where ts is the inlet uh, air temperature and ti is the outlet air temperature and m dot s is the air flow rate and cpm is the specific heat of the moist air right and similarly you can write uh, for the latent uh, heat you can write the energy balance like this latent heat transfer rate ql is equal to m dot s uh, into hfg which is nothing but the latent heat of vaporization of water multiplied by ws minus wi where ws is the humidity ratio of the supply air and wi is the humidity ratio of the outlet air okay suppose uh, i know uh, ti from our comfort criteria ti is known to me uh, okay and uh, qs and ql are known from load calculations then using this equation i can find out uh, and uh, i am also fixing ts let us say ts is fixed based on certain criteria then in the equation this is known to me this is known to me this is known to me so i can find out what is the required mass flow rate then what i do is i substitute this in this equation and again in this equation i know what is the latent heat transfer rate i also know what is the condition space humidity wi so i can find out what should be the required humidity ratio at the uh, inlet to the condition space so i can find out uh, this okay and once you know what is the required uh, humidity ratio at this point and if you also know what is the if these things are known to you then you can easily find out what is the rate at which heat is to be added in the reheater for example take a control volume across the reheater then heat to be added in the reheater qrh is nothing but m dot into cpm into ts minus t2 right m dot is known to me this is known to me and the, and the ts is known to me and if you know t2 then you can find out what is the uh, rate of heat addition in the reheater similarly you can uh, apply energy balance for the preheater and find out what is the amount of heat added in the preheater apply mass balance across the humidifier and find out uh, how much vapor has to be added in the humidifier like that okay in actual uh, winter air conditioning systems in addition to the basic components uh, you also have fans or blowers for air circulation and filters for purifying the air okay i have not shown these components in the schematic but in actual system consists of these components also in addition to the basic components now let us look at, uh, at an all year uh, or complete air conditioning system a complete air conditioning system can be used for providing air conditioning throughout the year that means during summer as well as winter the system consists of a filter a heating coil a cooling and humidification coil a reheating coil a humidifier and a blower 
In addition to these actual systems consist of several accessories such as dampers for controlling flow rates of recirculated and outdoor air control system, safety devices, etc. So, let me quickly show a schematic of a complete or all air air conditioning system. So, this is a typical all air in your air conditioning system, this is your conditioned space and uh, you have a filter for purifying the air, you have a heating coil, you have a cooling and dehumidification coil, you have a reheater, of course reheater can be here or it can be here and you have a humidifier and you have a blower for circulating the air, right. So, in uh, winter, uh, uh, we require heating and humidification. So, in winter, uh, you, you do not have to run this cooling and uh, dehumidification coil. So, this is not operational, okay. So, heating coil is on, reheating coil is on, humidification coil is on. So, you can achieve heating and uh, humidification and you can get hot and humid air here during winter, right. Whereas, during uh, summer, uh, we require uh, cold and uh, dry air. So, during summer, uh, what you can do is you can switch off uh, this, you can switch off this you can switch off this and you run only the cooling and humidification coil so that you can get cold and dry air at the inlet to the condition space, okay. Of course, the blower is always required because you have to maintain the air circulation either in winter or in summer, okay. So, this is always on, right. So, depending upon the season, the some of the components will be on, some of the components will be off, right. So, large systems use blowers in the written air stream also. I have shown a blower only in the supply air stream, but you can also use a written air uh, blower in large systems. And generally during summer, the heating and humidifying coils remain inactive as I have already explained, while during winter, the cooling and humidifying coil remains inactive. However, in some rare applications for precise control of conditions in the condition space, all the coils may have to be made active, okay. So, rarely uh, you keep all of them active, but uh, it is possible in some applications. And the blowers will remain active throughout the year as air has to be circulated during summer as well as during winter. And when the outdoor conditions are favorable, it is possible to maintain comfort conditions by using filtered outdoor air alone. That means, you can switch off everything and just run the blower, okay. In which case, only the blowers will be running, okay. Uh, and all the coils will be inactive leading to significant savings in energy consumption, okay. So, when outdoor air is cool let us say, then you do not have to use any cooling or dehumidifying coils or anything, just run the blower and use full outdoor air and provide comfort. And normally a control system is used in an all air air conditioning system uh, to control uh, the changeover. Changeover means you have to change over the system from winter operation to summer operation or vice versa depending upon the outdoor conditions, okay. So, a control system will be sensing the outdoor conditions and depending upon the outdoor conditions, it keeps either the summer uh, air conditioning system on or winter air conditioning system on, okay. So, this is uh, all about uh, an all air, uh, air conditioning system. So, let me uh, quickly summarize what we have learned in this lesson. Uh, in this lecture, we have discussed uh, evaporative air cooling uh, systems and we have looked at the working principle, different types, advantages, disadvantages, applications, etc. And we have also discussed the winter air conditioning systems with and without preheaters. And we have also discussed briefly the schematic and features of an all year air conditioning system or a complete air conditioning system, okay. Uh, so, in the next lecture, I shall uh, discuss uh, uh, the cooling and heating load calculations, okay. So, with this I stop uh, this lecture, we will continue this in the next lecture. Thank you.